The Cranky Geek WebRTC Spring 2021 show is possible thanks to our sponsors. Google, Agora, Element, Dolby I.O., Twilio, and Ring Central. See the links in the description for more information. All right. Uh, now I'm excited to uh, welcome the YouTube team. Actually, we're, we're using YouTube Live now for this broadcast, but uh, this team actually uh, has helped to bring um, live streaming for uh, Google Stadia, uh, which we've talked about in past events. So uh, to explain more, I'll hand it over to uh, Britt Sire and Ying Ying. Hey, I'm Britt. Hey, okay. I'm Britt. I'm a uh, member with Ying. We're going to talk about Woodward C Stadia live streaming to YouTube, how we take U- Stadia gameplay and send it to YouTube. And- Broadcast it through YouTube Live. Uh, today we're going to talk about WebRTC, C, why it's unique in Stadia live streams use case, uh, YouTube compared to other uses of WebRTC we have, uh, what makes it unique. And then Yang will talk about turn as an ingestion proxy, why we need to use turn and how we use it. And then we'll leave some time at the end for questions and answers. So you're all pretty familiar with this uh, WebRTC use case. Video chat conference, bi-directional, where we optimize for smoothness. The most important thing is that you don't ever get any buffering. Uh, you'll sacrifice quality resolution, frame rate, bit rate, in the name of getting quality. For live streaming, which we've done in the past with WebRTC, it's a little different. The ingestion side is unidirectional, uh, so you don't have any feedback. You only have one channel that you have to get the audio and video through. You have to do adaptive formats. And you really want to optimize for quality. Stadia, it's a totally different thing, where we have two sides, gameplay to, to the gamer, and then we also have the YouTube side. So this is what our system looks like. The Stadia instance in the middle does a RTC connection to the gamer on the left. Uh, that's bi-directional. That's very fast, low latency. Uh, that's interactive. And then on the right is the YouTube side, where we send live streams to YouTube with WebRTC, and we do our delivery. Uh, we don't use WebRTC there. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Stadia to YouTube part, the arrow to the right in the middle. So what's unique about Stadia? Well, for WebRTC, we usually do mobile live at YouTube, uh, so broadcasting from your Android iOS device uh, to YouTube. Those streams are a lot of just talking heads, a person just standing there with their phone out talking, very simple background, low bit rates, pretty easy to encode content. Stadia, on the other hand, is gaming. Gaming is high bit rates, high complexity. Uh, the content is sharp, it text on it. You really do care about quality on that use case where you don't in, Stadia, in uh, mobile live streaming. On mobile live, use H.264 because that's what's available on phones. Your Android and iOS devices have pretty good hardware encoding for H.264, but they can't really do anything beyond that uh, too reliably. Stadia, it's operating in the cloud, so we can use VP9 or higher quality codecs like AV1. Uh, right now, we use VP9. Uh, we have the extra compute we're willing to throw at it so we can get better bit rates. YouTube mobile live, we use SDR. Uh, that's the standard color space. I'm going to talk more about color in a minute. Uh, Stadia, we do SDR some, but we also do HDR, so if you'll handle high dynamic range content. Uh, mobile Live is one megabit on average. We'll go down to 300 kilobits, maybe a little lower, up to maybe two megabits. But we really stay in that low bit rate range. Where Stadia, high quality gaming, 4K 60, it gets up to 30, possibly up to 50 megabits. Uh, YouTube Mobile Live is on cellular networks, so we have to worry about losses, adapting our quality, uh, resolution frame rate. Uh, Stadia, though, it's coming from a Google network. The Stadia instance runs in the cloud. We're sending to the YouTube cloud. Uh, so it's a near-perfect network. So we really don't have to worry about losses, even though we have to deal with the 4K 60, 30 megabits HDR content. Okay. So, so like no packet loss, I guess is what you're saying. Yeah, we don't have to deal with okay. much packet loss on that. But it's still tough to deal with, with high bit rates. Uh, so talk about how we solved it, specifically the color issues. Uh, so for HDR... Uh, you have a few options. H.264 10-bit. Uh, no one really uses it, so you can ignore that. Uh, your options are the newer codecs. So HEVC H.265, well, we can't do that because it's got royalties on it. We don't want to pay royalties. AV1, you can't really do that because not that many people can encode AV1 right now. Uh, so you don't want to rely on that. Uh, in the future, we want to use it, but it's not there yet. So that really leaves us with VP9. Uh, VP9 is a thing, VP9 Profile 2. That's 10-bit VP9. Uh, you can negotiate that in the STP. Here's an example of it. Uh, you can see profile ID 2. Uh, when you set that, then you get VP9 profile 2, which is 10-bit, can express HDR. 
So I can't really show you what HDR looks like versus SDR because you're not looking at this on an HDR monitor. I'm not broadcasting HDR content. Uh, but when you get HDR, you map it to SDR to look at, and you can see the difference here. The one on the left is gameplay SDR, what it looks like when you're playing an SDR game. In the middle is if you took HDR content, which is much more vivid, brighter, uh, it looks generally better uh, when you map that down to SDR to look at. And on the right, you can tell it just doesn't look as good because it's HDR content where you just treat it as SDR. Uh, it gets a lot duller. You can't really see as much definition. Uh, it's just not as good looking, but the middle one pops a lot more than the others because it was HDR. Uh, there are a lot of kinds of HDR though. So when I say HDR, you know, there's a few different specs. There's a lot of them actually, and you have to know which one you're using. For us, VP9 Master Metadata gets included in the container in the color tag of WebM. Uh, that presents a problem though when we need to get the containerized video down to our transcoding pipeline is WebRTC doesn't have a container when it's on the wire. Uh, so we need to send this metadata across the WebRTC connection. And then when we containerize it on the other side, then we have to put the metadata on. So what metadata do we need? Uh, we need primaries, matrix coefficients, and transfer function. Uh, primaries are probably the important one, the most important one. It tells you which color space you're using. So here's an example of or an image that shows you different color spaces. The middle triangle is BT709, that's SDR. The next one is BCIP3. That's a uh, somewhat HDR color space. Uh, Apple likes to use it. Um, but now the most common one is BT2020, that's full HDR. You can see you get more colors or expressive color than they are in SDR. Matrix. And those, the, uh, the axes are like a percentage of... Uh... Uh, their chromacity, it's pretty hard to explain. Um, okay, all right. I, don't really uh, I guess that. people can, uh, can can see the, the Wikipedia article if they... Uh, yeah, you can look up the color yeah. spaces and you'll see these images. Yeah. Uh, and then, just because you have 10 bits doesn't mean you can map every color that you want to see. So our displays go up to 10,000 nits generally, uh, the very good ones. So that's 10,000 values you have to be able to describe, but we only have 10 bits. Uh, it turns out, though, that we don't need to be able to describe every possible luminance value because our eyes don't really know the difference. Our eyes are very good at differentiating very low, uh, low light differences, but at high brightness, we can't really tell the difference. So these curves here show you the different transfer functions that we could use that tell you what mapping of an integer value of your gray code to a luminance. So most of the gray codes get mapped to the low luminance values because that's what we can perceptually tell the difference between. PQ is our favorite curve, uh, perceptual quantizer. That's what we use. It's the red one. It just uses the vast majority of its bits are dedicated towards low luminance values. The place we sent this metadata that we need is in the RTB headers. Um, most important stuff, the primaries, the matrix. Uh, we get that here. We also get the luminance, minimum, maximum, mastering metadata. That tells you mostly how you map your HDR to SDR. So if you have someone who wants to watch your stream, in SDR, but you're playing an HDR stream, you have to make it available for them uh, and actually look good. This tells you the proper way to map it down. Uh, so it tells you what the screen is made for rendered at. You know, if you have a screen that can only play 5,000 nits, you don't want to get content that goes up to 10,000, uh, stuff like that. And, and you map this to, uh, well, I guess to RTP, because uh, so you can change these values. Uh... Yeah, so we put these in the RTB headers instead of at the beginning of the stream because we send this on a free keyframe. Um, so it could change in the middle of the stream. In practice, okay. that's HDR 10 plus. Uh, you don't really need to change the colors in the middle of the stream, um, but it is possible. It does happen in VOD, uh, and we could look into doing it for live. Okay. Uh, if you want to use it, API video, video frame.h in uh, WebRDC. Uh, you can see where you get it, where you set it. Uh, this comes in on the video frames. Uh, it's set on the very first one and on every keyframe afterwards, but you can get access to it on every frame. And then I'm going to hand it over to you to explain why we have a turn proxy for this and what it does. Okay. Uh, thanks, Brett. So I'll first talk about turn server, typical turn server usage in a uh, typical WebRTC application setup. And then I'll talk about why we use it as a live stream ingestion proxy. So TURN stands for traversal using relays around NAT, and NAT means network address translation. 
Tour service is an important piece in most WebRTC-based applications when clients cannot make direct peer-to-peer -peer connections. For example, in a typical video chat setup shown here in the diagram, the two clients can be behind firewalls, which is common for a home network setup. So in this case, the clients have their local IP addresses, but they need to send each other public IP addresses in order to connect. The public IP address is provided by the network address translation layer from the router, but the clients needs to discover their public IP address. One option is to use a stone server, which stands for Session Traversal Utilities for NAT. But this doesn't always work. For example, when they are behind us, when the clients are behind a symmetric NAT, the public IP address is returned from the turn server doesn't work in that case. So for that case, the clients will need a turn server that acts as a intermediary to send and receive data. And the turn server has public addresses and they can always be accessed by all the clients. Now let's look at how this applies to the Stadia live stream ingestion use case. The Stadia instances running on the Edge network have public IP addresses, so they are accessible by the clients. And they always try to form a direct peer-to-peer -peer connection with the player client whenever possible. So the player client is the one on the left in this diagram. However, for the live streaming part, our live ingestion server running in the core data center does not have a public IP address. So they are not publicly accessible. And the Stadia live streams are not considered, uh, are considered external traffic from our perspective because the external game developers control the game code running on the Stadia instance. So the Stadia instance can't form a direct peer to peer connection with our ingestion server. Um, and that's why we need a proxy with public IP address in this case. So we consider different solutions. One option is to build a new UDP proxy that can forward the UDP packet to our ingestion service. Um, and uh, another option is using an existing turn service that Google already has for the video, video chat applications such as Duo. So this turn service is high performance, it's written in C++ and can handle the high bit rate from Stadia live streams. And it's also already globally deployed, deployed. Whereas building a new UDP proxy from scratch will require significant development time and cost. Um, and in this case, both options would require an intermediate, intermediary service. So that's the same. The downside of using turn service though is it will require an extra four bytes per packet for the turn channel ID. But we think the, this overhead will not affect the performance where we're saving the development cost will be significant. So we, in the end, we choose to use an existing turn server as the ingestion proxy. And it worked pretty well. We can handle high bit rate like 30 to 40 megabit per second with very low packet loss. Um, so also on the ingestion server side, we set the ICE transport type to be relay only in RTC configuration. This is just an optimization so that it doesn't need to spend time collecting ICE candidates for direct connection yeah, case. That, yeah, that, that must be quicker. Do you, you have any idea how much, uh, well, I, I don't know if you've measured how much time that saves, but it's kind of... Oh, uh, in terms of... I guess uh, yeah, connectivity time, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, we didn't measure, but yeah, we did notice that it, it uh, it takes if it's like tries to to try to like get um, other direct connection candidates. This does spend more yeah. Time. I guess you get yeah. the advantage that you you always know the the turn relay connection is there, so you can you know, right you to that. Like you don't you don't have to wait you know to, for mm -hmm. a, a candidate to come back. Yeah. So that's it. Actually, that's the end of our presentation. Um, we're happy to answer any questions. Cranky Geek is possible thanks to Google, as well as industry sponsors.
Agora. Embed vivid voice and video in any application, on any device, anywhere. Dolby, the API platform for transforming media and communications. Element, talk to everyone through the open global matrix network, protected by proper end-to-end -end encryption. Ring Central, revolutionize your business communications with Ring Central APIs. Twilio, create real-time video apps that scale as you grow, from free one-to-one -one chats to larger group rooms.